Ben Askren, thank you very much for having my dad and I come to your academy. You got it. I just wanted to start by saying I think you probably are the most intelligent, articulate (laughs) MMA fighter that there is. I, I mean, no one else is writing books and articulating concepts and thoughts like you oh, can. You know, Mike Moicano is doing some interesting things. Uh, but, you know, it's also like saying, you know, you're really good at basketball when you're playing against really short people or something. <laughs> you know, so, you know, this is the, these people fight in a cage for a living, so uh, they aren't all the brightest of the bunch. Um, but I appreciate that sentiment. <laughs> of course, yeah. I, I got to think there's some other really smart ones. I just, Moicano is the one that comes to mind right now, and I'm, I'm sure there's a handful of other... Uh, really smart people, but uh, there's some that aren't so smart. Do you think part of that is due to the fact that you just didn't take as many blows to the head as others? No, I don't think that has... Uh, I actually saw a brain scientist last week. It was very fascinating. I had a great discussion with him. And he... You know, it's funny because I understood this concept of neuroplasticity, right? The brain's ability to change itself. And he said it doesn't look like I've ever had a concussion, which is, you know, unlikely. Probably through, you know, 30-some years of wrestling and fighting. Um... But, you know, he says he really does believe in the brain's ability to repair itself if you're doing the right things, which, you know, I don't do illicit drugs or alcohol. I sleep right. I, you know, I challenge my mind to work on a regular basis. So those type of things. I think, I, you know, I think there's actually a correlation with the CTE that they haven't made yet. And I actually brought this up to the guy. and He said he agrees wholeheartedly, uh, whether it's football or fighting and... Uh, other things they're doing also, right? So illicit drugs, partying really hard, drinking a lot, staying up late, these type of things are probably uh, cofactors in in your brain health. Mm -hmm. And you talked about neuroplasticity. That's really fascinating to me. And you risk, I feel like, when you start talking about that stuff, the body's ability to heal itself, Uh the brain's Uh ability to heal itself, your thoughts' ability to dictate your health, it almost starts drifting into that woo-woo. So listen, now you're going to piss me off. (laughs) uh, you, You might be on the same page with me or not, but... Dude, this amazing Senate hearing last week, I don't know how much of it you listened to, mm-hmm. uh, and these jackass liberals are calling it woo-woo. And it's like, we're talking about an, um, an America that has 75% of its population is obese. People are sick and dying. It's, it's fucking scary, actually, right? And so it's like, and all of, these, all of these really brilliant people are sitting in front of the Senate and, and simply saying, the food and... Uh, health industry is corrupted by big business and they're not letting the real science out, right? They're putting these studies out that show what they want them to show. And here are a whole bunch of relevant examples. Uh, you know, food is, if Fruit Loops was one, right? In other countries, it can have these ingredients. In America, it can have these ingredients, which are significantly worse for you. Um, or the fact that very few doctors have any idea about nutrition when nutrition is such a factor in our health. Um, and so, you know, I just got done reading. <laughs> I'm probably pretty militant on this because I just got done reading uh, Casey, Casey and Kelly Means' book, Good Energy. I just started another book. Uh, oh, my God, I forgot the author's name. Uh, Listen to Brigham Bueller on Joe Rogan. And so, yeah, I think this is, it's almost a crime against humanity what the American government has allowed the food and uh, medicine companies to give to their people. Mm-hmm. Oh, no doubt. And okay. one thing I know so we're on the same about page. Then. We're on the same page, okay, absolutely. And the yeah. thing is, me, when I, I tend to be a skeptic on most things before Ooh, I buy in, fair. of course. That's I fair. feel like that's the right way to be. Critical thinking. Good yeah. skill. I just went off. I went on no, <laughs> I did no, a no. camp West Saturday, and I went off on critical thinking and how uh, Americans don't want You see, now you get me going all the time. Uh, a lot of American people you know, on the top, they don't want the kids to critically think when it's like the most important skill you can have. And I told my wife last night, the whole hate speech thing, it, it almost infuriates me. Because if you have like a 72 IQ, you're saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> people shouldn't be able to say hateful things to each other. It's like, this seems reasonable enough. But if you have just a slightly higher IQ, you realize, well, wait, who determines what's hateful, right? And is whosoever party is in charge going to determine which is the hateful speech? Who determines what the misinformation is? Because if we're saying it's the government, I mean... They've been spewing misinformation all the way back since they said there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But, I mean, think about how many things they got wrong in a row over coronavirus. I mean, it was, it was like they just couldn't have been more wrong. It was like wrong, 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 just the whole way through. What would the reason be for saying the wrong things on purpose? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't even know. I won't, I won't even allege that they said it on purpose. But what I, what I will say is they said, well, this is a science. You must listen to us. Everything else is misinformation. And it's like... 
Well, no, the whole point of science is to make an observation and then test your observation and figure out what is actually correct. That's the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if we go far enough back, uh, everything revolved around Earth. Mm -hmm. Right, mm, and if, right. if no science, if that was the science, and no one was ever able to test a hypothesis that, hey, maybe that's not really true, we never would have realized that yeah. we actually revolve around the sun. You're talking about science, yes, and we're talking about you know woo woo stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Kyle yeah. Dake, right? He is. He was ahead I of the curve. Up, yeah, well, I back <laughs> yeah, up a lot of my stuff that alarms people at first by saying, hey, there's this guy. He's a Cornell grad. His name's yeah. Kyle Dake. Yeah. He's a phenomenal athlete. Mm -hmm. He's a two-time bronze medalist at the Olympics in wrestling. He's an athlete. He's what yeah. we all strive to be, and he does this. Yeah. Grounding. Yeah. I'm going to just go on a limit. I naturally did. <laughs> I, yeah, I naturally did that shit for the last 30 years. Yeah. Right. I just don't like wearing shoes. So uh, I was grounding before grounding was cool, before everyone knew about it. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the first thing that I noticed when you came in today. Okay, yeah. You don't look the same as you looked mm -hmm. in the UFC even when you yeah. box Jake Paul. Well, the US, both of those were unfair examples of my <laughs> physique, and I mean, I'll, I'll just explain to you why. Um, and, but I've, no, I've never been like super shredded. Uh, you know, as a competitor younger, there were times when, I, especially when I was making like 163 for wrestling, I was very lean at that point in time. Um, but, you know, looking good is never the point of competition if you're a competitor, it's competing well. And right, so, you know, my physique got a backseat to everything else. Um, unfortunately, the, the times when the most eyes were on me were times after I was retired both times, right? So the first time I got traded to the UFC, I was happily retired. I was running my wrestling academy. I hadn't gotten on a scale in freaking nine or ten months since I retired after my previous fight, you know? I had, for the first time in my whole life, I had to not weigh in, you know? I was... Was that 33 or 34? That, I was 33 or 34 uh, when I retired the first time. And, you know, so really probably since 14, I've been wrestling year-round. So we're talking about, I've been making weight year-round for 20 years. I said, listen, I'm not going to get on a scale. I'm going to eat whatever I want. And then, you know, I got bigger, obviously. And, and it was actually right around the time where I'm like, <clears throat> I need to do something. Because, you know, if I'm going to be retired, I, I don't want to be really fat. So I'm going to do something. So I started working out maybe a little more, you know, fervently and then and then I got traded so you know when I get traded it was like okay I had whatever three or four months to prepare for my first fight after being retired for 10 months or 11 months whatever it was you know um, and then the Jake Paul fight was even worse because I had my hip replaced and when you have a hip replaced they say literally you can't even put any weight on it for six weeks and then for the six weeks following that you can do not, nothing besides walk around you can't pick up weights or you can't do anything you know and then after that, you can start riding a bike. And my, my physician in the beginning had told me, like, I have to wait a year until I can do full contact. And, you know, so I think I was at, like, three and a half months out when I got the call. And they said, hey, do you want to fight this guy? And I'm like, I feel great. I ha I literally, but I literally haven't worked out in three and a half months because I've been told to not work out. So I was eating whatever I want, not checking my weight, and literally not allowed to work out. You know, mm -hmm. so then... Uh, it's a long story, but I ended up kind of getting the A-OK -okay from the doctor. And so, you know, like, well, I want my hip to stay forever, right? Or for a very long time, I don't want to get another one. Um, so I kind of, like, ramped up the intensity of the exercise a little bit in week one, a little bit more in week two. You know what? I only had, like, I think it was, like, 13 weeks to get ready. And so it was, like, the first three weeks was me kind of, like, ramping up to try to, hey, make sure this is going to actually work, you know? And, um and it worked, but I was really heavy, obviously, and I was bringing my weight down. And now, yeah, I mean, after that, it was kind of like, okay, now I'm really going to be retired for the rest of my life. So let's make the right decisions and be as healthy for as long as possible. Let me ask you this, and then we'll get off the topic. People who I told I was talking to, yeah. they want to know, was the Jake Paul fight rigged? Yeah. I hate that question. I think it's a really ignorant question. We'll go back to, there's a lot of people in America with a 72 IQ. Um, Maybe if it was right after the fight, you may have come up with that preconceived notion because you thought he wasn't very good, and a lot of people don't want to be good. But now he's fought how many other times? He's beaten other pro boxers. Like, I'm not a pro boxer. I was never great at boxing. It was never my specialty. Um, so even if you, if you were to think that, like, right after I fought him, which I would still take issue with, now after he's beaten all these other guys who are way better than me, the notion you could even have that in your head still is 
preposterous. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm just relaying the questions okay. I said I would right. ask that one. All right. Oh, man, he really had no... Well, dude, now you can tell all your friends that they have a 72 IQ. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I thought it was crazy. Is this true? Jake Paul actually was a student at one of your camps. Is that right? Did no, you teach Jake Paul how to no. wrestle? No, I made that. That was, a, that was, you a, did. That was like a meme. Oh, uh, fake, fake you got thing. me. Yes, yes. Let's talk, though, <laughs> about other loudmouths, not in boxing. Okay. And I'm referring to Jake Paul being a loudmouth, not you, because yeah. that's not you. Yeah, well, I can be loudmouth. <laughs> that happens. AJ Ferrari, mm-hmm. Carter Storacci. Yeah. The beef going on between the two of them. They're not going to wrestle, unfortunately. You don't think so? Wouldn't that be well, good no, for the they sport? Just, they just announced the All-Star. The All-Star is Parker versus uh, uh, Carter Storacci, which is great. You know, that, that is... And, you know, uh, I told Flo, I said, Flo, put on Rocky versus Ferrari. And they said Carter versus Parker's uh, bigger match. I said, what? Well, I fully understand that. Uh, but, but they're probably going to wrestle in the NCAA finals. Like, the, court, the chances they meet up over the course of the season because they're going to be number one and two in the same weight classes are very highly likely as opposed to Ferrari's wrestling a different weight class. So the chances they actually meet up are slim to none you know so uh that was kind of my logic or my reasoning but yeah i'm excited for parker and carter to wrestle i think it's gonna be great do you really think that parker and carter would get more eyeballs than aj and carter? Uh, i don't know i mean that, that's what flo i can tell you that's what flo thinks right uh and i you know i think flo is probably just sick of ferrari because yep. he has especially a, cp he hasn't yeah. been treated too well by and aj yeah, i mean aj is kind of dumb because the last time you know Christian kind of said something, I will say, semi-nice about him, you know, and then he still bagged on him. It was like, well, that guy said something nice about you. Like, just take it and walk away. I don't know what to tell you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who do you think would win, though, if they did? It's got to be Carter. I mean, AJ hasn't been competitive in a long time. He's done, I think, one tournament in the last, I don't know if it's three years. It's been a long time. Um, you know, and he looked very, I'll say, average at that tournament. You know, he won the overtime match. Uh, he just didn't look great. So, yeah, I don't think there's any notion he's going to be uh, who knows? Maybe he gets his shit together and he can be competitive at the highest level. But at this, you know, from what we're seeing now, it's unlikely. You enjoy sports psychology mm-hmm. in psychology in general, I would assume. Yeah. Your new book, Extreme Balance. I ordered yeah. this. Paradoxical Principles of the Champion. Well, yeah, so it was great. Amazon. Uh, I don't know how many they ordered, but how many they ordered, they were all gone on day one, uh, which is awesome for us. But then it's like kind of like you lose the momentum because it's like. You know, you want to keep pumping it and say, buy the book, and then, but then people get pissed if they can't get the book, you know? So um, they ordered, I know they ordered a bunch more, and they're in stock again. Uh, this is something that was in my head for a really long time. I, I've been interested in sports psych like, forever. I actually, am, I'm, after this, I'm going to the post office first. I'm sending a copy to uh, a guy named Rick McGuire. He was the head of USA Track and Field Sports Psych. Um, and I got interested in sports psych in college, and I don't know, I don't even remember how I did this, but somehow I convinced the University of Missouri to give me three credits to go talk to Coach McGuire as an independent study <laughs> for like a whole semester. And it was the greatest thing ever, and he loved me, and like, we would go in, and we'd talk for an hour about sports psychology, and he'd be like, all right, have a great day. I'd be like, do I have any homework or anything? He'd be like, nope, I'll see you next week. <laughs> and so like, literally, I'm going to go talk to this brilliant mind for you know, an hour at a time for a whole semester, however many weeks that is, you know. And so, you know, I've moved on. That was, you know, what, 17 years ago or something. And he's moved on, but I just kind of reconnected with him and, and sent him a copy because, of, you know, I tried to write a book previously on sports psych, and it was, it, you know, it just wasn't as good as I thought. So then I didn't want to put it out. Um, and this one, I think, is really, really, really good, and I've been getting great reviews, so I'm excited for uh, people to read it. Well, something I want to talk about. One, it's kind of a lightning rod in this sport. A person, a college wrestler, it's A.J. Ferrari. Mm -hmm. What chapter in this or what subject (laughs) do you think you would highlight? All of them. (laughs) Really? Um, I mean, probably the the, the most obvious would be... um, Oh, man, no, there's a a bunch of them. So we could go with with him. I think um, thinking you're good enough and and thinking you're never good enough, there's a good one for him because he probably has an inflated self-view. Um, and it's important to, at times, to think you're not good enough, right? Because if you think, hey, I'm too good. I don't need to listen to the coaches. I don't need to listen to anyone. I got this all figured out. And you're going to miss out on a bunch of good advice, wisdom, help that you can get from other people, right? Um, I would say uh, preparing for everything and expecting the unexpected. I would say um, respecting your opponent and crushing your opponent. He needs maybe a little more respect to his opponent. 
Yeah, and probably, probably, probably being individual and being a team player, um, given a, I don't know that he was the best teammate at Oklahoma State, so I don't want to bag on him too much. But yeah, right. he, he could probably, it would probably give him great wisdom to read the book. Right. I, for one, am a fan. I really yeah. am of AJ. Maybe not everything he does, but he's so, he brings eyeballs to the sport. I really think I mean, that. but this is just a generally, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't want to air all his business uh, because I've obviously got a lot of things shared with me privately that maybe I've never expressed publicly, but um, I don't know if you knew as much as I knew, it would probably be hard to be a fan. Really? We'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at yeah. that. Yeah. On to another <laughs> character in the sports world. Right. You know what? Before I say cool. that, Uh-oh. tell me this. In USA Wrestling right now, on yeah. the count of three, say who you think is the biggest draw, that gets the most eyeballs. When a match gets posted on Flow yeah. Wrestling... People swarm to it. Probably still Jordan Burroughs. You wait on. Uh, supposed to count three. Oh, oh I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Austin DeSanto. No. I watched Flo publish a Jordan Burroughs match and an Austin DeSanto match, and I've seen it more than once. DeSanto match gets thousands more views, at least in the first day. Hmm. I would be interested to see. I mean, uh... Just, man, I just I don't actually agree with. I mean, I I, I, I know I could probably get the real numbers. Um, I would think Spencer Lee is bigger than Austin. I would think Jordan Burroughs, Kyle Dake, David Taylor. Uh, at least those four. They're bigger for, names. I'll know, give you that. Well, but bigger. You, but you're. I mean, you are right, and you're saying bigger names should be quantified by something, whether it's the amount of followers on social media, the amount of views on matches, these type of things, right? Because you got to quantify that somehow. Right. Um, so I would say at least those guys, and I think I could probably start throwing a handful more in there. Mm-hmm. I feel like, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong, and I have not went and looked at the numbers. Um, and I wonder how Flo would quantify that. Probably some version of, you know, Instagram followers and Twitter followers and, you know, the, mat, the amount of views each match gets, those type of things. I bet Flo would, I honestly think they would agree because I see them post the most random things just about Austin DeSanto to get yeah. some views. He definitely, definitely gets eyeballs and, and people definitely enjoy him. Uh, now, I thought my phone was right here. I was going to text Christian and say, hey, <laughs> what's the answer? Tell me. I'd like to say Christian's the man. He's yes. doing so much good at flow wrestling. He does a good job. Christian, love what you're doing. Yeah. Fun guy. He keeps that Flow Wrestling Radio. Ever since you were gone, you know, a lot more mm-hmm. fell on his shoulders. Yeah. He does a great job yeah. managing all of it. Yeah, he does. He keeps order. He's the father yes. of Flow Wrestling, I feel like. <laughs> I want to tell JD and, uh, and uh, Tyler that you call them the, the sons. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are great, too. Yeah. I like them a lot. I loved res- uh, uh, listening to Flow Wrestling yeah. Radio Live, yeah. especially when you're on there. I would yeah. listen to it all the time, and I'd go yeah, on a long can. run. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. A lot of fun. Do you miss it? Uh, you know, I was back on a couple weeks ago. Um, do I miss it? Yeah, there's parts of it I miss, but then yeah, there, there's obviously, you know, freeing up some time and not having the obligation of, uh, you know, it's like you have to know about the topics you're going to talk about. And if you don't know about them, you sound like an idiot, right? And you don't want to sound like an idiot. So you make sure to watch the matches or do the research or read the articles of whatever you're going to talk about. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's obviously, I mean, this is like, I, I was just saying someone, someone that have problem I have a lot of great opportunities in life and you know you do only have 24 hours in a day and so you got to kind of really pick which one that you want to do the most and um uh yeah so there's things I miss but um I'm happy with the choice I made Mm -hmm. and I want to stay on the topic a little bit of psychology Mm -hmm. in sports yeah you in your book funky Mm -hmm. you know you wrote about you were a, a fat kid yep and you, <laughs> you willed yourself at what age to lose how many pounds? Uh, this is amazing, I Yeah, thought. I think I was 11, or either 11 or 12. Um, it was sixth grade winter, so whatever age that is. Uh, yeah, I went from 130 pounds to 100 pounds, um, just by kind of changing diet, right? That's where, you know, I brought up earlier when they're like, you know, nutrition has nothing to do with diet or, you know, with lifestyle. It's like, well, yeah, like, you, if you eat the wrong way, you can, you're literally going to be obese and, if you're obese, it's literally going to take years off of your life. You know, it's going to cause you all kinds of problems. Um, and so, you know, I, at that point, it was like uh, no soda, which that one, I never started drinking soda again. I think soda was gross. Um, uh, no fast food. I still don't do that, really. You know, so there's a whole bunch of things that I cut out. Uh, and, you know, some of them now, you're <laughs> 30 years later, and they haven't came back. So right now, you look fit. You look yeah. like you're in fighting shape even yeah. more so than when you were actually fighting. <laughs> well, of course, there's reasons for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. 
Is there any th change in your diet and your workout regimen? Um, work. I mean, actually, I try not not to work too hard. <laughs> um, I'm old and I don't recover like I used to. So, you know, like say if a bunch of our good college guys are back in town, um, I will wrestle hard with them one day, and but I generally will not do it multiple days in a row. Like I'll wrestle hard on you know a Monday, and then I'll maybe wait till uh, I don't know uh, a Wednesday or Thursday if I'm going to go hard again with them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I eat a lot of meat, not so many grains, a lot less carbohydrates, uh, a lot of fruit and vegetables and meat, and that's yeah. no dessert, right? No dessert. That's, that's been, a that's big been thing. forever now. That's been uh, twenty months or something. No dessert. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a big one. It's a lot of wasted calories. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I, I thought I was actually like, I thought I was like, shit, this is gonna be really hard. And then it like wasn't kind of hard at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't miss it. Mitchell Messenbrink, one of your athletes. Mm -hmm. John Messenbrink, your coach. Yep. He's at Penn State now. Mm -hmm. He wrestles so great. His yeah. foot on the gas the whole time, and it seems like he's really having fun. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the case for a lot of these Penn State guys. Yeah. From a psychology perspective, I know they have a psychologist on their mm -hmm. team. Yeah. What do you think is Cale Sanderson's secret? What is he doing know. right? I sent him a book, and I said, I hope you read it. And he said, I don't really love reading, so we'll see. Did he really <laughs> say that? He said, he said, I don't love reading. So. He's a funny guy. Uh, you know what's funny? I mean, I, I would, Mitchell says a lot of things that we do are very similar to what they do. I wouldn't be shocked if we're pretty philosophically aligned on, you know, preparation and training. Um, you know, I, I could imagine him reading the book and saying like, well, yeah, that's, you know, very similar to the actions that I take. Um, yeah, he just, I mean, he, I think he recruits for kids who, Want to compete hard and, and want to, you know, like enjoy the sport of wrestling. Um, and then I think he kind of nurtures that. And you know, the thing that's funny, he just doesn't burn people out. Um, and that's the case at all levels of wrestling. Is there's just a lot of coaches who are still burning kids out, and there's just uh, I don't know. I, I don't understand how they haven't figured it out by now. It seems so obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I remember watching these Dan Gable practices from mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. There was guys, you talk about overtraining, a guy yeah, in a neck yeah, brace, yeah. he's wrestling. Yeah. Uh, Morningstar, there's clips of him in the uh, neck brace uh. wrestling. These guys just screaming, crying, and mm -hmm. coach yelling at him to keep yeah. going. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, and I would say a long time ago, right, and that's, you know, 30 years ago or whatever, um, cardio and toughness played a much larger factor because technique wasn't nearly at the level it is today um and you know that also is like there's just a lot of kids who are they're really into it and they are tough and they are in good shape and so it's really hard to win just that way you know so you have to have all these technical skills and so if you're neglecting the technical skills well the other guys are going to be tough and in shape too and so if they have better technical skills than you then they're going to beat you mm -hmm. i was just reading a book by ryan holiday on okay. stoicism mm -hmm. and he was talking about how the way to approach business life really any pursuit yeah. is to be relaxed in your mind but driven in your actions something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it makes me think of the way mitchell wrestles because he's loose as yeah. are a lot of these penn state guys yeah but their foot's on the gas it's yeah. like they're not scared of getting tired. It yeah. looks like they're having fun. They probably yeah. are having fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Throwing caution to the wind sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Is that the philosophy that you teach at all? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always say, um, you know, because I push back against parents. One of the things that parents do a lot, and unknowingly, I, I, I think there's probably a very tiny percentage of parents who actually try to sabotage their children. Um, but a lot of them are doing it maybe unwillingly or unknowingly. And so... If I said, if you said, hey, what's the number one value you want in a wrestler as they get older? I want someone who's just fearless. Like, they just don't give a shit. They're going to go fight you no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the score is. They're, I mean, they're just going to show up and fight you, right? Um, and so, you know, when parents are always like, oh, watch out for this, watch out for that, be careful here. It's like you're, you're literally building fear within them. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to dismiss the fear from them. Because in a wrestling match, um, you know, obviously you say that, you know, there's, there's no real actual harm that can happen, right? Injuries are uh, minimal, say. Um, and so even if you were to make some mistakes early, as you, if you're smart, you're going to get better and better and better. And, and you're going to say, oh, I made a mistake that way last time because I was maybe too fearless. And now I realize that's an area of danger. So... I'm going to attack you still. I'm just going to avoid this area. Or I'm going to do this little thing differently. Or I'm going to keep my elbow down a little more. Like, they're going to, you know, these small little details, they're going to figure those out over time. 
But if you build a kid who's highly fearful, it's so hard to get over it. I mean, I have, there's been certain kids I've tried for years to just get, you don't get over, whether it's their fear of losing or fear of making a mistake or whatever. It's so difficult to erase from their mind. So if, if when they're young, you can build them fearless, it's going to really, really, really help them. Do you tell them to like repeat any things in their no, mind? No. What's I, the pre-match ritual for your guys? I don't really have a pre- I think everyone should prepare themselves differently. But I think the thing that I would, you know, I'd encourage is we never ever yell at them for making mistakes. Like, you know, when they're younger, it's never like, oh, you're an idiot. You did this wrong. It's like, hey, great, great effort. Great effort is usually the first one. We want effort. Uh, if we can't have effort, we're not going to get all the other things. So great effort. Here are some things that you could have done which would have helped you win the match. So I can make a suggestion without hammering. I'm like, oh, hey, when you shoot, you're shooting with your arms out. That's why you're getting underhooked, right? Or, you know, hey, you're stepping your leg right next to your head. That's why you get cradled. So, like, I can make them intellectually realize these things without making them fearful. Um, so I think, you know, first is we just applaud great effort. And then, you know, we just try to make the small corrections and make it about the wrestling. And then, you know, as they get older... Um, and so I'm older, especially like eighth or ninth grade, like pushing them more and realizing that they have more in them than they realize, right? Because everyone, uh, I, there's this really good saying that I, I don't remember where I heard it now. So I stole, I stole it from someone. I don't recall who I stole it from, but it's really st- like important in these types of situations is the hardest thing you've ever done is the hardest thing you've ever done. So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's a one mile walk, still the hardest thing you've ever done. If it's a hundred mile run, it's still the hardest thing you've ever done. And so, like, when a kid has pushed themselves, they'll say if they're, you know, uh, if they have a gas tank that's 20 gallons. Well, in the beginning, of, if they push a 10, they're going to think, oh, man, I'm tired. I don't know if I can go any further. And you have to make them realize, no, you can. You can. Let's go. And then they push a little further. And they think, I can go that hard now. And the next time they get there, you're like, hey, let's go. You can go harder. And then they push more, right? And you just keep, like, making them realize that they have the capability, that they can just keep pushing harder. And... Um, once you know obviously once they really want to be there and once they really want to do it then it's kind of not that hard because they they want to be great at it so it's like i don't even gotta tell them like i don't have to convince them why they should do it they just know hey you know coach ben's got my best interest in mind and if he's telling me to go harder i'm gonna freaking go harder let's talk about one mm-hmm. of your favorite people mm-hmm. and one of the men who is a huge fan of you and that's dana mm-hmm. white yeah. how good did it feel when you went from bellator and one championship mm-hmm. The whole time Dana White's bashing you, yeah. saying Adavan needs to take Ben Askren to go to sleep. Yeah. How good was it for you to go into the UFC and then he has to promote you and say how awesome um, you are and why people should watch your fights? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't. Really, I, I didn't even really think of it that way, just because I was I was living my life and I you know unconcerned about him. I don't know. You know, you say it's like. I, uh, if you ask him what his honest opinion of me is, I don't. I think he'd probably respond relatively positively because, you know, um, and I don't know. I don't know why he had the misconceptions, and I don't know why he didn't sign me initially when I was leaving Bellator. Um, that would have been way more ideal. Uh, but it's like I showed up ready to fight. I, you know, I, I I literally needed a new hip, and I still fought three times in six months. You know, like I showed up. I said, "Give me the best guys you got. I want to fight them, and let's do this." You know. Um, and really, you know, in, in six months, I think I probably fought three guys who will likely be Hall of Famers. Or you, the, probably the, the, they all fought for at least three titles. Like, you know, uh, they're all really, really good opponents. And, you know, he, his, the narrative he was trying to push was that I didn't want good competition, but that was all, that was all I wanted. So I showed up and I went and said, hey, give me the best you got. Um, you know, unfortunately, it didn't go my way. And, you know, part of it was probably because I needed a new hip and I wasn't quite as competitive as I would have been earlier. Mm-hmm. You talked about in your book, Funky, about how much you respected Robbie Lawler. Yeah. That was an exciting, exciting mm-hmm. match. Yeah. Do you think Robbie was out? Yeah, when his 100%. Hand? You thought he was, yeah, think he was out? Yeah. Well, I think what happened, I mean, I th- if, what happened was I choked him. He went out. You watch his hand fall. That's not, that's not the uh, hand falling of a conscious person. What happened was Herb came at me. I relaxed a little bit. And when I relaxed, before I let, actually let him go fully, I don't know if you've ever been choked out, but you you know there's sometimes when you like you don't even realize you went out, like you know because in senior practice your partner's not really trying to hurt you, so they 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 get you, you know they're gonna let go right away, and you wake back up and you're like oh shit was I out, you know you almost forget about it. Do you think that Islam Makachev, mm-hmm. Mahachev, yes. or Khabib, do you think they could really compete at a U.S. Open here in America if they just uh, jumped into a freestyle match? I, my intuition is, is no. 
Um, and I would, I would like to see it. There was, I can't remember where I read a rumor that uh, Mahachev was wrestling with someone who was a current Division One NCAA champion, and he was getting way more takedowns. Um, although I don't know the same weight class or same weight, I, I don't really recall that information. So uh, my intuition would be no, but I would like to see it. He whooped Chase Sildate. Yeah, but Chase Sildate was in high school. And, That's right. You know, he's never been above, say, a 12 to 15 ranked guy. You know, he's good. He's good, but not great. And I'd love Flo to put on an event like that, Dagestan yeah, versus. U.S.? Oh, yeah. that'd be so awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. How does walking out to the arena, I, I don't know where you wrestled during your uh, mm-hmm. D1 championships when you won it all, yeah. how does that compare to walking out in the UFC? And how does that compare to mm-hmm. one championships? Uh, one always had a very full crowd when I was there. And there, there were a few Bellatoros that were very large when I was there. The one I fought in Lima was a really big crowd. And the one where I fought Koreshkov was a really big crowd. Uh, I would say all those are very similar. Um, you know, cause I'm not really focused on the crowd, right? I'm focused on, you know, c- competing the best to my optimum ability, you know, mm-hmm. a few seconds later. So I'm kind of like locked in, um, not really all that concerned. I mean, I try to enjoy the, you know, Hey, I, I earned this pressure is a privilege type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then just get locked in on what I need to do. How do you think prime Ben Askren would have done against a prime McGregor, a prime Khabib? Yeah. I don't like I don't like doing the uh, how would I have done thing because I in my life I try to say like either I did or I didn't you know and unfortunately when I got my opportunity uh, and I could say hey it was because my hip or whatever but I, I didn't get it done you know um, and had I been younger and healthier would I have I, I don't know maybe I would have um, I had a great skill set and I did well against really good people in practice but uh, that was it I, ne- I never got the opportunity to get in the cage. Uh, in my younger years with some really, really good people. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying in a press conference with the UFC, I thought it was awesome. You said, Dana, you were getting on his nerves. And there's, I told you before this, there's compilations of you trash talking in the UFC and picking on Dana and annoying Dana that had, these videos have 5 million views and you didn't know that. I had no idea. I don't know how to search myself or anything. Um, yeah, and then, you know, obviously I was a very fun personnel in the UFC, and that's why I really, I actually don't know if Dana maybe was under the impression that I was not going to be marketable when I came, when I was a free agent in 2013. Uh, but I think I would have been highly marketable as I was later on. Um, and so, you know, he probably would have got a lot more of that, uh, that trash talking had I came over earlier. But you said you would take on Khabib, you know, undefeated yeah. against undefeated. Someone's O's yeah. got to go. And it would be yeah. like Rocky 3. I yeah, think that's awesome. Rocky 3. Uh, 4. 4. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Dang yeah, it. Yeah, Shoot. Yeah, yeah. You made a whole video yeah. uh, training That montage. got like 5 million views also. That's crazy. If I could have beat If Jake Paul was worse at boxing, that would have been like the greatest... Uh, Highlight video of all time. Yeah. If, if you haven't watched it yet, watch Ben Askren's training montage. Unfortunately, it was good, though. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. Man, um, which one sucked worse? Was what? it George Masvidal? Oh, yeah, that one for sure. Because, I, you know, I, um, uh, I had fought for so long, and I was undefeated. And, you know, I never really... I, in my first 18 fights, there was one fight that was competitive. That was it, right? Um, And so I had held the notion for a long time that I was the best in the world, but I had never got the opportunity to prove it. Uh, I think the highest I was ranked was five or six, and I had never got to fight anyone who was above me. And so when I retired the first time, I said the only way I'm unretiring is if I get to fight someone who's above me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I beat Robbie Lawler, a former UFC champion, you know, and kind of relatively former, right? There was only, it was was him and then Tyron, and Tyron was the current champion when I came over to the UFC, so you know, he was like the, the previous champion, we'll say. Um, yeah, so, you know, I set myself in a position where I'm fighting George Masvidal for, to fight for the title, and it's like, I should beat that guy, like, every time, you know, and just, it just so happened, he executed a really good move, and I didn't, but if I beat him, then I'm fighting for the title, and this is something, right, I've been kind of, like, kept out of, because I was a free agent for the first time in 2013, when I was, I was... You know, twelve and zero and seventh in the world, and Dana chose not to give me an offer for whatever reason. Um, so I had been kind of like striving for this this ability to prove I was the best in the world, and I was I was that close, and I I, I blew it. It yeah. that's that stunk to watch because yeah. people that don't know MMA and they don't yeah. know wrestling like they should, they might think that, and you're not going to agree with this probably. They mm-hmm. might think that George was a better fighter than you, well, but you do that ten was, times, unfortunately. 
you know what? You're talking like a coach. That's yeah. true. Well, that's, that, that is what it is. In a, in a fight, I can make excuses and bullshit you, but in a fight, it's who's going to get their hand raised, and there's a myriad of ways to do it. And, you know, fighting has more variables than wrestling. And wrestling, I think, you're going to get a way more consistent result. Um, you know, but certain sports have, you know, a wide variety of variables that you can play, and you're going to get different winners. You see what Colby Covington did with his wrestling to George, yeah, though, and you yeah. got to imagine. Well, like, I knew he sucked at wrestling, but yeah. yeah, I didn't get to take him down. What do you think of Colby? You wrote about him briefly. <laughs> He's an idiot. Uh, there's one of those 72 IQ fighters we talked about, yes. Is it because you suspect he's insincere that it just doesn't hit the same, or is he going out of bounds because... No, he's... In, uh, oh, I mean, I think both, but he, he is absolutely insincere, sincere, and he is, he is low intellect. Uh, I'm being serious when I say that. Um, yeah, he's just, just generally unlikable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One more question about the UFC. Sure. There is only one person who is on, I would think, on your level in wrestling, either in the UFC. Their name is Bo Currently? Nickel. Yes. Well, um, yeah. Let's see. Hen- well, Henry's still there. Oh, Henry's not retired, is he? Henry's not That's retired. That's crazy. Yep. Olympic gold medalist. He doesn't use his wrestling. He doesn't enough. use his wrestling quite as much as he probably should. Um, you know, he, did, he didn't have a great folk style base, right? Because he started doing freestyle exclusively when he was 15 or 16. And, you know, folk style gives you the ability to hold someone down and beat him up. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say that because I, I would have to think through the whole roster. Which, right. That's like 600 people. So. Right. Yeah, but Bo, Bo's great, so let's talk about Bo. Do you think, how would he do against Chemayev? Do you think that he's going to be a champion? Uh, I think there's a relatively good chance Bo Nickel is going to be a champion. Um, I don't know how much longer it's going to take. Probably like, I think they're probably going to start ramping up with better opponents. Um, he's fighting Paul Craig and... Paul Craig's, he's tough, but I mean, that's one where Bo should win, I would think, relatively easily. Who did Paul, there's someone else that Paul Craig got out grappled by, um, who's not nearly as good as Bo Nickel. I'm blanking on who it is right now. Anyway, so I think Bo Nickel should win easy, and then they'll probably start elevating his competition level. I could absolutely see him being uh, a champion. I don't know how long it's going to take. You know, if he never gets there, it is tough, and there's a lot of variables, like I mentioned. Uh, I would assume at the very worst he'll get close. Mm-hmm. What about against Jemayev? How how would he do? I don't. Jemayev hasn't shown up for a fight in forever, so let's. Just, um, uh, yeah, I haven't seen him. So I mean, I'm probably leaning towards Bo, but um, I don't know. Tell me about Extreme Balance again. Mm-hmm. Your new book sold out mm-hmm. relatively quickly on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Back in stock. Back in stock. That's right. I'm getting my copy soon. Mm-hmm. I hope. Mm-hmm. How? Wh- what are people? Should they expect? To learn yeah. from this book, who's it for? Uh, was for everybody, but I, you know, I, th- I think the higher the level athlete you are, probably the more you build to take away from it. Um, you know, it, it really at a low level in athletics, physicality can play a large role. Um, it doesn't matter how much more effective someone thinks if the other guy's way bigger and stronger than you, it's going to be difficult um, to compete with them. And so, you know, by the time we're getting like older and better. The way you think is a, a large part of how successful you're going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but so I think, I feel like I t- actually had a friend, just, he texted me last night and he, he read it and he had a really good review for me. But it's, it's, uh, he said it's the realest sports psychology book he's ever read, which that was a huge compliment. Um, and I feel, I, the reason I wrote it, uh, it was I felt like there was no other sports psychology book that talked about uh, these dichotomies where these two parts, they go together, but they're, they're kind of opposite of each other. And most people have a really, really tough time holding both thoughts in their head at the same time and when to use them. They're more like, you know, so like uh, push through the pain or pull, you know, when to pull back, pull back the reins. Um, you know, there's certain guys who say, I'm going to tough, I'm going to go through everything. And you're like, okay, that's great, good, good quality. Like, I want you to be tough, I don't want you to be weak. But then certain times... Um, they go too much and they just keep hurting themselves, right? And maybe uh, they're out for way longer than they should be because, right, they refuse to just chill for a minute. And then, you know, on the other side, pull back the reins. We have some kids who they don't know how to push themselves and, and they get a little ding and they're like, oh, I got to be out for three weeks. You know, like, it's a bruise. Like, come on, you know? And, but so the, the perfect balance is someone who's really tough, who could go through something if they had to, if they're on the battlefield, right? Like, They'll go through it, but it might be a better idea to say, hey, I'm going to take a couple of days off. 
That way I'm going to heal and I'm going to feel better because being tough is not the ultimate quality. Is like, is the ultimate quality is being ready to compete when I, when I need to compete. Mm-hmm. And being hurt is dumb. So, um, you know, it's, I said, yeah, probably one that Penn State does really, really well. Like, they rarely show up to NCAAs with a bunch of hurt guys, you know, whereas, you know, someone like Iowa feels like they always have braces or bandages or tape somewhere, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just think of Carter Strachey and Spencer Lee. Yeah. Spencer Lee wrestles with two torn ACLs, yeah, uh-huh. and that's awesome. Yeah. But did that affect his performance at the Olympics? Maybe yeah. in some small yeah. way or some large way. Yeah. Carter Strachey, though, he's mad at Kale Sanderson for not letting him wrestle at the Big yeah. Tens. Yeah. And then he does make it happen, though, at the yeah, NCAAs. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be that's a great example of, like, you know, uh, I would say a stupid coach, a stupid athlete, would have said, yeah, go wrestle at Big Tens. So like, what are you, a wimp? Go wrestle. And then maybe he gets hurt worse, and maybe he can't win, you know, the NCAA title because he tried to be too tough. But, you know, Kale's like, well, no, you're not trying to win a Big Ten title. You've already won a bunch of those. You're trying to win the NCAA title, so I'm going to not let you wrestle and pull you out. You're going to even throw a fit about it, fine. And then NCAAs, you're going to be more healthy. Yeah, especially yeah. now. I mean, if he didn't do that, he might not get this yeah. uh, million dollars, million, yeah. according to I that one I coach. I don't really believe that. That guy's an idiot. You don't think he's getting a million bucks this year? Uh, I mean, would I, would, I be, would I be shocked? I would not be totally shocked, but I think it's probably all likely. What are all the different business ventures that you're involved in right now? You <laughs> have right, seven so academies. Yeah. This is just the first one right here, seven this in Wisconsin. Time. Yep, so this is right down the street from where I grew up. Um, so Max and I and my high school coach, John Messamerick, we started the academy since 2011 and since I've expanded. So the second one was Mequon, which is north of Milwaukee. Um, and then we went to Green Bay with Josh Wagner, who's one of our college teammates. And then since then, we've got four others. So we're northwest south, uh, and south of Milwaukee. Uh, we're in Madison. We're in Green Bay. And then we have two smaller towns, Fond du Lac and Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, it's great. People love wrestling. Uh, we... It's wild. Even at this first location, it's been over 13 years. We're still growing. And it's like just more and more kids are enjoying wrestling. And, you know, that was kind of the, the whole point of what we wanted to do is we wanted to give kids a place where they could wrestle as much as they want to wrestle. And we thought if it was, if it was presented appropriately, kids are going to freaking love it and they're not going to be able to get enough of it. Mm-hmm. And that has been the case. I feel like Wisconsin's on the rise yeah. as far as uh-huh. wrestling states go. Yeah. So many wrestlers are... I, Caden from the Clash Actually, of Combat, yeah, uh-huh. is he from Wisconsin? Yeah, he wrestled with my brother when I mean, he was in high school. So he wrestled at my brother's academy. Yeah. I mean, between you, that guy, he has, I, last I checked, a half million subscribers on Does YouTube. He? Yeah, he's I know he's really popular. Big name. Yeah. A lot is happening in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah. You guys, your team beat Izzy Style Wrestling not too long ago. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, wrestling in Illinois, I think it's big as well, but Wisconsin's yeah, yeah. right well, there Well, Illinois has been really good, but the, you guys had a uh, little struggle of a corona because there were just so many lockdowns where they wouldn't let people do it's anything. It's a tough state, man. So, uh, oh, yeah, that, that, kind, of, that kind of gave you a little dip. But, uh, yeah, they always have a really really competitive team. I mean, everywhere in the Midwest has some uh, really good squads, whether it's, you know, Minnesota is always good, Iowa, Illinois. So Midwest is a great place for wrestling. Yes, Wisconsin is on the rise. We won the junior duels, which was a big thing that we'd never, ever won before. Um, in June, that was, a, that was a huge deal. That was kind of what, like, one of our goals that we wanted to do. Um, and we're having a lot of guys have success at the NCAA level also. Who are some of the big name guys that you can give a shout out to right now that are in your uh-huh. room? Um, well, Connor Minnesota is at Penn State. Um, I don't want to do that. I got too many kids that, that I like, and I don't want certain ones that feel jealous. So we got a lot of guys who do really great things. You can stay for practice and film somebody if you want to. We got practice at 5 p.m. Really? 5 yeah. p.m. practice? Five. We have, so at this academy tonight, we have four, pra- four different practices. We have a 5 o'clock high school, 5.15 high school, a 6.45 high school, and a 7 o'clock girls class. Jeez. So we got a busy night. What does a typical day for Ben Askren look like from start to finish? When do you wake up? Yeah. Uh, well, now my daughter's going to middle school, so she's got to get up early. So I've been getting up right around 6, which I'm usually not a morning person, but I've had to become one. Um, practice every, almost every night here at the academy, to here doing something. Uh, and then my day is just, you know, it's like whatever needs attention. Um, you know, some like yesterday I was at our, our, brand, our building in Franklin, Wisconsin, south of Milwaukee, just helping clean up and getting some things all set. Um, going to Keegan O'Toole's wedding this weekend. So you, you never know what's going to come up. Sometimes it's, you know, figuring out marketing for Extreme Balance. Sometimes it's, you know, talking with a guy from All In Journal and doing that. Um, 
you know, something I travel, I don't travel a lot. Last week I traveled to the clinic in Maine. Um, so yeah, just whatever comes up. I got a whole bunch of different things. Okay, so you don't sound like you have such a rigid schedule. I do not have a rigid schedule. Okay. Very free during the day. Very busy. I mean, I got I to fit a lot of stuff in, but it, it is like I can move stuff around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of that, we have just a couple minutes left here, and then I will let you go because yeah. you got some things you got to yeah. do. You talk about Michael Chandler mm -hmm. in your book a little bit and how yeah. he was very rigid. He needed specific yeah, food, uh, yes, prepared yes, in a specific yeah. way, everything yeah. like that. You're not that way. Do you do you have a specific diet well, that you follow? I, okay, right so now? I uh, I know you eat a lot of meat. You don't. Well, eat no, no, but but for 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 com competition's sake, I think it can it can be. It can, it, you should have some type of general routine, right? You should for sure. Whether it's your warm up, your diet, there should be a general routine. But you can't be too rigid because that can do yourself a disservice. Because um, say. Uh, you show up and they don't have the right food. What do you do? You can't, you, you can't go wrestle because they don't have the right food. Uh, actually, in this book, Extreme Balance, I interviewed one of my teammates, longtime teammates, who's my, probably my main training partner for a while, Gerald Mearshart, who's, uh, I think he's now like the middleweight submission record holder ever in the UFC. Like, he's doing a really good job. And he says, uh, was I think the Prepare for Everything chapter, um, he said he started fighting really early and it was like, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Rinky Dink mixed martial arts shows, but they're a disaster. My cousin Joey Reese, <laughs> he's a champion in the making, he's in that stage right now. Okay, so he's in the Rinky Dink stage. So he said, uh, Gerald said, you know, there's a whole bunch of times I'd be like warming up in the kitchen or I'd warm up in the coat closet or I'd, I, you know, he's like, you'd show up and you didn't, wouldn't really know what to expect. You just had to, get, you know, get, on, get it on and get ready to fight, you know? And he said, well, my very first fight in the UFC, he said they were running behind schedule on TV time, and, he, and he said they literally brought us out by the cage and made us warm up in front of the crowd. And he said, well, I wasn't phased because I had done this many times, because I had all these awkward experiences. And he said, he said, I think my opponent was very thrown off by it, and I think I had a competitive advantage because I was ready for anything, and he was not. So it's one of those things where it's like, yes, you probably should have like, things that you like and want to do and some type of routine, but you don't want to be too rigid because you don't want something to get flipped up. You know, like when we wrestle, it's like you go international. It's like, if you have a way you want to cut weight, but uh, you know, you go in there and the sauna's cold. <laughs> like, well, you, you can't sit in the sauna, figure it out, you know? Um, so I think you just can't be too rigid. Right. Yeah. You're not an emotional guy. This is the final part of okay. this conversation. Oh. How does it feel to look back how old are you here? I'm 40. Just 40 years old. Yes. To say that you've accomplished all that you've accomplished. You've yeah. been the multi-time champion in different MMA organizations. Mm -hmm. yeah. You are a two-time national champion, two-time Hodge yeah. Trophy winner. You run seven academies. Yeah. You have how many children? Three. Three, <laughs> three girls. That we know of. No, I'm, not <laughs> joking. I'm joking. I don't have three kids. Um, how does it feel? I have two girls I mean, and a boy. You, uh, it's great. You know, I had this part, uh, this moment of reflection um, and when I was, I, so I read the audio book for Funky, um, which you were referencing earlier. Um, great book. Highly recommend it. Yeah, it was, I, 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 it was fun to write. Um, but I had this, uh, I had this moment in the end of the book, it says something like if myself now could reflect on what my 11 year old self thought I could accomplish. Although I didn't get where I wanted to get exactly, it's like, holy shit, I'd be proud, you know? And so I, I think about that sometimes. And, you know, that's, it's always, I think, gratitude is a really, really important thing. Um, and that can come in a lot of different ways. And it could be like the opportunities of the people you have put in your life or, you know, certain things that have broke the right way for you. And so, uh, yeah, sometimes I think like, holy shit, I had the number two book selling sports psychology book on Amazon for, you know, for a week. Like, that's fucking wild. Like, I never saw that one coming. Um, you know, or I don't remember. There, there was something else recently where I was like, whoa, how did that happen? You know, like, I, I don't even recall what it was. But yeah, kind of so. the story of your life. How did that happen? Whoa. Well, I mean, crazy. I know, you know, over the, um, over the, you know, the course of time, it's like I, I wake up every morning. I'm I am very disciplined. I work very hard. I try to do right by as many people as possible. That's one of those things that, um, uh, you know, one of the pieces of, uh, of advice people don't maybe give is like, and I think about that with coaching academy, if I can do right by as many people as possible, they are then going to feel a debt of gratitude to me, to whether it's to make themselves work harder or be more loyal or whatever it is. But if I'm doing right by them, they're going to stick around. 
So if I can just do right by as many people as possible, it's gonna pay back to me in some way, shape, or form, whether it's through building my business or maybe someone does it a favor for me at some time, but it's just like, just wake up and try to do good by as many people as possible, and that's gonna be long-term, highly beneficial, right? And some people wake up and they, they have the opposite mentality, which is, right, how do I take advantage of people today or how do I get one over, or, you know, kind of like a really finite mindset where there's only a limited pie and I gotta, I gotta get my piece of the pie. Where it's like, no, I think I can just wake up and try to help as many people as possible um, and do as good as possible and then <laughs> go to sleep and do it again the next day. What's next for you? What's the future look like for Ben Askren? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, all I wanna do is run wrestling academies. So um, hopefully keep building great wrestlers, keep growing the wrestling academy system. You know, and this one where it's like, keep doing right. It's like, so if I do right by the managers in my system, they're gonna stick around. They're gonna keep kicking ass. And then they're gonna help how many other kids, you know? Cause it's like, for me, I'm only one person. I can only be one place. But if I have seven managers and you know, I, we were doing a coaches summit and there's like 29 coaches coming. It's like, and if we can, Help you know, give them our vision and they can go do right. It's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, and you know, at some point, probably thousands are going to be like experience a different, uh, different way of life because of the way their coach is helping them think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, do you have any other projects? I don't think so. I think just trying to do as good as I can here. Ben Askren, you're the man. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. We are right on time. It's time for you to get going to wherever Perfect. you have to go next. Okay. But hey, thank you so uh, much. Extreme man. Balance, can't yes, wait sir. to read it. Awesome. All right. Boom. Yeah. All right. You are welcome to stick around for practice. I don't know if I it's wish I could. or not. I wish I could. I have to get back to Illinois, so we've made a three-hour drive here. Mm -hmm. I wish, though. That would have been awesome. Yeah, we got uh, Actually, the Minnesota case is coming to stick out the more athletes today. Oh, right. oh, sweet.